Okay, I'm going to attempt to um, I'm going to attempt to show you guys how to do this um, creating this content. Oh, uh, not this content, but uh, this is like videos and junk that I left my desktop. I'll just push it on off to the other desktop. And same with this stuff. That's all going to the next desktop. Because that was that's what I like to do. I like to throw all my crap on the different. <laughs> this is the way my room looks. Anytime I want it clean, I just push all the crap to the side. So um, we're going to create a kit. Uh, I don't know how successful this is going to be because I've been having problems creating kits uh, in Unity for Alt Space VR. Uh, my experience with Unity is like one day. Today was the only day that I ever messed with Unity. My experience with Blender, 25 years. Um, I've been using it since 98. Um, not to say that I still know it. I'm, I'm losing stuff all the time. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with Blender 2.04, which is 25 years old. It's an ancient version of Blender. And we're going to erase this square and we're going to put some text. And we're going to say, call it toys. And then we're going to go to the these keys right here and adjust the bevel resolution and extrude it. Uh, let's see. We're extruding it. And let's go to perspective mode. Adjust the our bevel resolution. Extrude. That's the bevel. Adjust the bevel resolution. And this is that adjusts our extrude. So let's just extrude it enough that we get a sense of sl uh, solid effect. Uh, then you do an Alt C to convert, to convert format then to a mesh. And then you select all the points and you do a smooth on it. Uh, I forgot how to do that. Auto smooth? No. Uh, where's the smooth operation? There, there, that's the smooth. That's the, the set smooth. There it is. That's what we want. So that. Do a set smooth. Uh, let's uh, weld everything together first. So we have to do a weld operation. Where is the weld? Remove doubles. There we go. And there we go. It's nice and smooth. Let's uh, give it a little bit. Um, remove doubles. Okay. Now it's nice and smooth. What remove doubles is it looks at the nearest neighbor of any vertex and it uh, melds the uh, vertices together so that uh, when you smooth it out it's going to um, it's going to um, to do a smooth operation uh, to get grow shading your vertex normals have to um, your edge edges have to um, your your vertices got to, to be connected to your edges uh, your faces got to be connected by the edges um, if the, none of the faces are are um, joined by an edge, then you can't have a grow shading. Um, it, what the grow shading does is it adjusts the vertex normals and um, uh, does lighting. If the vertex normal is uh, got the dot product of the vertex normal to the light, um, 
is like one and it's bright that means they're they're facing each other uh, if it's zero then they're not facing each other it's going to be a little bit darker and it's going to be black if um, if it's negative I think is the what the dot product does I'm not sure it's been a long time since so I've dealt with dot products I just know that's how they how they uh, determine how things are lit is using a dot product of the vector normal so you can see what a vector normal looks like by turning on the normals draw normals and so if we go into edit here and ex increase the normal size and say draw normals there's our normals okay let's reduce the normals the normal is a vert is a vector pointing out I'm giving you a little bit of a of a of an understanding of a vector is a is a um, is basically a line that's got a uh, a origin and it's got a direction and so it's like a it's like a finger pointing out in some direction and uh, the normals um, normals are uh, vectors in, with re respect to something and so a vector normal of a vertex normal is a normal that's pointing out from a vertex these are face normals they're normals uh, they're f and they come out of the center of the face so that face has got a normal sticking out of it and it's this one right here that's the that face is normal and those normals, whenever they're pointing at a light, that it determines the brightness of that surface. And the grow shading, all it does is it just colors the surface from one surface to another. Uh, it it adjusts the brightness according to how um, it changes from edge to edge. I think it's an edge an edge. Uh, effect let me see what so it's actually a vertex the vertices are the ones that are being affected see this one's a little bit brighter than that one and that one's darker and so you get this long dark line going between this you see it's blending between those two between those two vertices and this one is brighter so there's a lot less going on and uh, it just shades each triangle um, according to these vertex normals, how they're getting lit. It's not the face normals that are determined. The face normals are just uh, you can you can if you know what the um, normals are for the vertices, you can determine what they are to the faces and vice versa. If you know um, the where the you can figure out where a face is pointing by doing a cross product on the vertices that make up the polygon. That will determine where your normal is, and from that you can determine what the normals are for the what the vertex normals are by doing um, by doing um, vector additions between um, the 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 polygon so this polygon is going to have a vector point off that direction this polygon is going to have a vector point off in that direction the vector addition of those which determines the edge normal and to determine the vertex normal you would look at you would uh, look at the other edge that it shares with and you could determine the vertex normal from that by just adding those two normals together and you would get your vertex normal and the vertex normals are um, what ultimately get lit, uh, the vertices, and uh, that, and from that it determines how to light the surface, and that's how you get the smooth effect, is by having those vertices uh, shared, um, by having all the polygons share their vertices. Um, you could go the opposite direction by. Uh, uh, well, 
one way is to make all the vertex normals um, for make each, each polygon its own which I think is what happens whenever you do a set solid and if I do a set solid then it looks like this and what happens in the case of a set solid is the vertex uh, each polygon um, the, the program is actually taking every polygon and treating it as its own and taking the vertex normals for each polygon and it's aiming them in the same direction as the surface normals. And so that's what's determining whether it looks solid or soft. And this is what happens whenever you do vector addition uh, between uh, the the edges and to determine the vertex normals. This is when you adjust the vertex normals. If the vertex normals are all pointing in the direction of the of the of their polygon face normals, then you would get uh, set solid. That's the the major difference between those. And uh, anyhow, but they have to they have to share uh, vertices. Otherwise, you're not going to get this. So I'm just going to have this nice soft toys thing here, and I'm going to go ahead and save this out to toys blend. And I'm going to go into the newest version of Blender. And I have to close the window. I had it open for something else. Uh, but I wanted to close window, come on. Okay, close it. I told you, close it. Yes, quit, damn it. Okay, I'm going to open it up again. Blender's gotten lethargic over the years. 25 years later, it's slower than, than what it was when it was at 2.04, of course. You won't have more needs and more wants, and that's what happens. You get more crap in here. And, uh, let's see what's going on here. I might have to recalc the normals on this. Uh... to the what happened to the mesh features uh, look there's just so much less stuff in here take this and center it on the pivot point or the, the origin there we go and uh, move cursor to selected center on or how do you center 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 view to cursor. That's Alt Home. There we go. And uh, I want my space ball back. File preferences. User preferences. Input. Uh, Trackball. Give me my trackball back. Yeah, there we go. That was a better way of orient. I hate the fucking turntable. That's for the people. Turntable are for the guys who use 
alias and use all those programs and can't stand that this stuff makes them sick. They don't like that, but I love it. It's the way it's the way to do to orient yourself. And if you need something more, and you know, get yourself a split screen and uh, put uh, put another split in it and uh, set this up for orthogonal views and do one side and one in front and uh, if you want to have a camera in there you can put a camera but we're, but we're doing kits I keep forgetting what I'm doing here so we go ahead and we have to export this to FBX. You need the FBX exporter. I don't know where I got it from, but uh, that's what you need. And then you save it out as toys FBX and say export FBX. And uh, oh, this is a question. When I do a export FBX, it should have some options down here and it does other experimental apply transform custom properties yeah I don't know what the hell all this stuff does but uh, we already saved it out so we might as well quit I don't need that um, then we bring up unity And it has to be Unity, uh, the exact version that they want, which is this one, Unity 2018 1.9 F2. That's the one they want. And uh, you open up a new project. Uh, actually, you don't have to. Just use the existing project. Until loads up. Ooh, did it crash? No, there it goes. Okay, and then you um, you go and you go to assets. Make sure you have this in there. Go to assets. So you you're gonna need to go to. Uh, there's a certain page to get your um, UT downloader or the whoa. That's not what I wanted. Uh, alt space. Let's see. Oh, I remember what I did. I did a site alt vr dot com. That's a, a search search by site domain on Google, and then we pop in there. Um. um Unity and uh, how do I get started with the Unity uploader? And that's how I found it. And uh, so uh, join SDK Slack. I don't think you really need it, but uh, read our world building get started guide. You don't need that. Install Unity Hub. Click. Or install this version of Unity and you need the Unity uploader you download this and uh, and then you click on it and it comes into your world and now it becomes part of the thing and uh, so you hit cancel 
I already have it. It's in here. That's what that is. And then you, uh, you go to assets. You go import new asset. And you find your toys, which we put up, the FBX. Hit import. Then it pops up down there. Get everything that's in this scene. Uh, all the, the stuff that's in here. Um, edit, select all. Delete it. Uh, oh, well, I didn't want to do that. I meant delete everything in the scene. I don't want everything in the scene. So let's delete that. Okay. That's all I care about. And then I want to drag and drop this in there. And it's got a camera in there, and I don't want that camera in there. So let's delete that. It says it'll break the thing. Who cares? And uh, toys. Let's drag the, drop that onto that. And get rid of the toys thing. And just select the text, what we want. Then you go up here to templates, select kit, call folder name toys. And the asset name is going to be text. Um, the word is what it's going to call, be called. And then I say convert game objects. So I got this selected game objects to kit free prab. That'll take it a while. And kit assets created. Then I go down here and I say load prefab directories. And I select build toys. And it shows where the zip file is. We're going to need that. We, we, it's still not up on the site. So we have to go into our browser. And we go to, um, I go to my thing on, uh, I'll go to my upload, uh, to one of my links. And then I have to get into kits. And uh, the toy kit. What it really, it really shouldn't be called toy. It should be called toys. So let's create another one. Call it toys. Is the name of it not toy? Toys, toys. This one. So create cat. And then we go in and we say edit. And choose a zip file. We select toys and we hit open. And then we say update kit. And uh, and if you if your if your uh, kit is not named after if the uh, asset thing is not okay if up here if this kit's folder doesn't match the name of the if if none of that matches if the toys doesn't match if none of that if you're not using toys throughout up to there um, and you bring it into here and you load it up it will complain and it'll say it can't find uh, asset bundle and then it'll say did you name such and such and what it's really meaning is did you name that folder toys did you name uh, and um, actually this is the load kit prefab directory I think that's that's the name that I gave up here whenever I created the folder. But anyhow, um, it's in there. 
And so I went ahead and let's see if, the, if we got the artifacts. There it is. So it's already in. I did that by uploading that zip file into the, that folder. Now we should be able to get it inside the space. So I'm going to close my space. And I'm going to open it up again. It's my alt space VR. And what I've been told is don't ever use these kits in your own home space because if you've got a camera sitting in the kit, it will and I've and I've I've run into this bug already, it will use that, that camera as a as a as the primary viewer. Okay. That's my channel Z is going off there see okay so let's move to a world mine and we'll create our, uh, let's go someplace where there's no music at I was gonna enter here I was creating Donald Fagan land and I don't know if we got a TV in here and I'm working on it, trying to get that into a, make that into a channel Z that's going to have some Donald Fagan in it. But I'm going to go in the space editor and I'm going to get my toys. It should show up in my kits under T T T T T T T T T T T. There it is. Toy toys toys. I had both, but uh, let's go for this one. Click. There it is. Click. And there it is. And it's, I can move it around. And it is the wrong direction. It says it's the word. Turn it around. Confirm. There we go. And scale the sucker up. Make it about 300. Gigantic. There we go. And uh, I'll move away from it. And uh, move it around. And just have it be the altar of toys. And um, lock all. There we go. And there's our toys, and, and it's fully smoothed and everything like the way I saved it. And uh, then I should be able to, it should stay there. And if I go back someplace else, say I go back to one of my, my 80s music land, or the, or the Alan K room. I'll get the Alan K room. This is the guy who thought up. This is the guy who came up with the, with the the computer that we know it as. IBM was the Microsoft of yesteryear. Microsoft is the new IBM. Uh, of course, the mean what it means today. Then remember that, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah, let's okay. Go. I guess it was okay. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> uh, they're not the same as IBM used to be. IBM was kind of crazy, you know. Uh, that was an informal oral code of white shirts. You couldn't wear anything but a white shirt, generally with a starch collar. Uh, I remember attending my first class and a gentleman said to me as we were entering the building are you an ibm -er? and i said yes he had a three-piece suit on that's where of the of the vogue and he said could you just lift your pants leg please i said what and before i knew it he had lifted my pants leg and he said you're not wearing any garters i said what he said your socks they're not pulled tight to the top you need garters and uh, sure enough, I had to go get Carter. 
IBM is like Switzerland. Conservative, a little dull, yet prosperous. It has committees to verify each decision. The safety net is so big that it's hard to make a bad decision, or any decision at all. This is an interesting documentary. It's a three-part documentary. You have to watch it all. Um, 25 years marching in step at IBM. He feels better now. I mean, it's like getting 400,000 people to agree what they want to have for lunch. You know, I mean, it's just not going to, it's going to be lowest common than, you know, it's going to be, you know, hot dogs and beans. So, um, so what are you going to do? Uh, so I mean, had created this process and it actually made sure that quality would be preserved throughout the process, that you actually were doing what you set out to do and what you thought the customer wanted. At one point, somebody kind of looked at the process to see, well, you know, what's it doing and what's in the overhead built into it. What they found is that I'm going to put the, it my the toys here to ship an empty box. By the late 70s, even IBM had begun to notice the explosive growth of personal computer companies like Apple. The Apple II, small, inexpensive, simple to use. The friends you keep on Altspace determine what you get as, uh, as kits. That's how you get all these kits. It's because I have all these friends that have kits. And uh, they'll have access to my kits as well. So, and let's put the toys up there. Down here. So if you friend me, you'll have access to my kit. But I have kits I don't think you should really get into because uh, they'll crash you, you know. It's no secret. I have an Apple. Sure, there's a big computer three flights down, but it won't test my options. You might charge or edit my reports like my Apple. People who got it were religious fanatics about them. So the concern was we were losing our hearts and minds. And give me a machine to win back the hearts and minds. In business, as in comedy, timing is everything, and time looked like it might be running out for an IBM PC. I'm visiting the IBMer who took up the challenge. In August 1979, as IBM's top management met to discuss their PC crisis, Bill Lowe ran a small lab in Boca Raton, Florida. Whoa, I, I, I adjusted the wrong thing. Whoops. 40. He knew the company was in a quandary. Wait another Whoops. year and the PC industry would be too big even for IBM to take on. Chairman Frank Carey turned to the department heads and said, Help! He kind of said, well, what should we do? And, uh, and I said, well, we think we know what we would like to do if we were going to proceed with our own product. And he said, no. He said, uh, at IBM, it would take uh, four years and 300 people to do anything. I mean, that, that, it's just a fact of life. And I said, no, sir, uh, we can provide you a product in a year. And he abruptly ended the meeting. He said, you're on. Well, come back in two weeks and tell me what you need. An IBM product in a year? Ridiculous. Down in the basement, Bill still has the plan. To save time, instead of building a computer from scratch, they would buy components off the shelf and assemble them. What in IBM speak was called open architecture. Uh, IBM never did this. Two weeks later, Bill proposed his heresy to the chairman. And frankly, this is it. Now, the key decisions were to uh, go with an open architecture, uh, non IBM technology, non IBM software, non IBM sales, and non IBM service. And we probably spent a full half of the presentation carrying the corporate management committee into this concept because this was a new concept for IBM at that point in time. Was it hard sell? They are talking about the birth of the PC. And as a result of, uh, of him buying it, uh, we got through it. With the backing of the chairman, Bill and his team then set out to break all the IBM rules and go for a record. What are the IBM section? <laughs> Once IBM had decided to do a personal computer, and to do it in a year, they couldn't really design anything. They just had to slap it together. So that's what we'll do. We have a central processing unit, and uh, let's see. You need a, a monitor or display and a keyboard. OK, a PC, except it's not. There's something missing. The operating system. Time for the Crinsley crash course in elementary computing. 
A PC is a box full of electronic switches, a piece of hardware. It's useless until you tell it what to do. It requires a program of instructions. That's software. Every PC requires at least two essential bits of software in order to work at all. An operating First, system and a, a basic operating That's system. What you type in to give instructions to the computer, to tell it what to do. Remember, it was a computer language called BASIC that Paul Allen and Bill Gates adapted to the Altair, the first PC. The other bit of software that's required is called an operating system. That's the internal traffic cop that tells the computer itself how the keyboard is connected to the screen or how... I think you really meant to talk about the BIOS and the, the, the operating the system on top of that. Operating systems tend to have boring, unfriendly names like Unix and CPM and and MS-DOS, but though they may be boring, it's an operating system that made Bill Gates the richest man in the world. And the story of how that came about is, well, pretty interesting. So the contest begins. Who would IBM buy their software from? Let's meet the two contenders. The late Gary Kildall, then age 39, a computer science PhD, and a 24-year-old Harvard dropout, Bill Gates. By the time IBM came calling in 1980, Bill Gates and his small company, Microsoft, was the biggest supplier of computer languages in the fledgling PC industry. Many different computer manufacturers are making the CPM operating system standard on most models. For their operating system, though, the logical guide for the IBMers to see was Gary Kildall. He ran a company modestly called Intergalactic Digital Research. Gary had invented the PC's first operating system, called CPM. He'd already sold 600,000 of them, so he was the big cheese of operating systems. In the early 70s, uh, I had a need for an operating system myself, and uh, it just uh, was very natural. Bill thing. Gates kicked his ass. A need for an operating system like that. Um, so, uh, it was very natural you can hear thing. how this ha came about. So basically, it's basically his It was the dominant thing, and it would always be the dominant, because... You know, Bill did languages and Gary did operations. Boy, Bill really lucked out. He really honestly believed that would never change. But what would change the balance of power in this young industry was the characters of the two protagonists. So I knew Gary back when he was an assistant professor at Monterey Post Grad School, and I was simply grad student. Uh, and, and went down, sat in his hot tub. Uh, smoked dope with him, and uh, I forgot about off, this part of the story. Uh, commiserated and talked nerd stuff. He liked playing with gadgets, just like Waz did and does, just like I did and do. He wasn't really interested in, in, in how you drive the business. He, he worked on projects, things that interested him. He didn't go rushing off to the patent office and patent CPM and patent every line of code he could. He didn't try to just squeeze the last dollar out of it. Gary was not a, uh, a fighter. Gary avoided conflict. Gary hated conflict. Bill, I don't think anyone could say, backed away from conflict. Nobody said future billionaires have to be nice guys. Here at the Microsoft Museum is a shrine to Bill's legacy. Bill Gates hardly fought his way up from the gutter. Raised in a prosperous Seattle household, his mother was a homemaker who did charity work, his father a successful lawyer. But beneath the affluence and comfort of a perfect American family, a competitive spirit ran deep. I ended up spending the Memorial Day weekend with him out at his, uh, his grandmother's house on Hood Canal. She, she turned everything into a game. Uh, it was a very, very, very competitive environment. And if you, if you spent the weekend there, you were part of the competition. And it didn't matter whether it was hearts or pickleball or swimming to the dock. I mean, you know, and there was, there was always a reward for winning, and there was always a penalty for losing. One time was funny. I, I, I went to, um, to Bill's house, and he really wanted to show me his, his jigsaw puzzle that he was working on. And he really wanted to talk about how, like, he did this jigsaw puzzle in, like, four minutes. And, like, on the boss, it says, if you're a genius, and you would do the jigsaw puzzle in, like, seven. And um, he was into it. He's like, you know, I can do it. And I said, no, you know, I believe you. You don't need to break it up and do it for me. No. <laughs> Bill Gates can be so focused that the small things in life get overlooked. He was busy. He didn't bathe. He didn't change clothes. We were in New York, and the demo that we had crashed the evening before the uh, announcement, and Bill worked all night with some other engineers to fix it. 
Well, it didn't occur to him to take 10 minutes for a shower after that. It just didn't occur to him that that was important. And he badly needed a shower that day. <laughs> The scene is set. In California, laid-back Gary Kildall, already making the best-selling PC operating system, CPM. In Seattle, Bill Gates, maker of BASIC, the best-selling PC language, but always prepared to seize an opportunity. So IBM had to choose one of these guys to write the operating system for its new personal computer. One would hit the jackpot, the other would be forgotten, a footnote in the history of the personal computer. It all starts with a telephone call to an 8th floor office in that building, the headquarters of Microsoft in 1980. At about, uh, oh, about noon, I guess, I called Bill Gates uh, on Monday and said I would like to come out and talk to him about uh, his products. Bill said, well, I'll be out next week, and they said, we're on an airplane, we're leaving in an hour, we'd like to be there tomorrow. Well, hallelujah, right on. Steve Ballmer was a Harvard roommate of Gates. He had just joined Microsoft and would end up its third billionaire. Back then, he was the only guy in the company with business training. Both Ballmer and Gates instantly saw the importance of the IBM visit. And Bill said, Steve, you better come to the meeting. You're the only other guy here who wears a suit. So we figured we're going to do this. We'll put on suits. We'll put on suits. We'll go to this, this meeting. We got there roughly 2 o'clock. And... Uh, we were waiting in the front, and the uh, young fellow came out to, to take us back to Mr. Gates' office. I thought he was the office boy. And, of course, it was Bill. He was quite decisive. We, uh, we popped out the non-disclosure agreement, the letter that said that he wouldn't tell anybody we were there, and that we wouldn't hear any secrets, and so forth. He signed it immediately. Well, IBM did make it easy. It had to sign all these funny agreements that sort of said, I. IBM could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and use your secrets however they, they felt. But so it took a little bit of faith. Jack Sams was looking for a package from Microsoft containing both the basic computer language and an operating system. But IBM hadn't done their homework. They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the, he didn't have the rights to do that. And it was not, he said, but I think it's ready. I think Gary's got to go. I said, well, no, but no time like the present, call Gary. So Bill, right there with them in the room, called Gary Kildall, Digital Research, said, Gary, I'm sending some guys down. They're going to be on the phone. Treat them right. They're important guys. The men from IBM came to this Victorian house in Pacific Grove, California, headquarters of Digital Research, headed by Gary and Dorothy Kildall. Just imagine what it's like having IBM come to visit. It's like having the Queen drop by for tea. It's like having the Pope come by looking for advice. It's like a visit from God himself. And what did Gary and Dorothy do? They sent them away. Gary was, he had some other plans. And so, so he said, well, all right, you'll see. And then, so we went down to three of us. IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure. And, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think is easy and wrecked respect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, to, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here and we don't want to hear anything confidential. And uh, she read it and she said, I can't sign this. She, she did what her job was. She got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure. The lawyer, uh, Jerry Davis, who's still in Monterey, uh, threw up on this uh, non-disclosure. It was uncomfortable for IBM. They weren't used to being waiting. and. And, and it was an unfortunate situation. Here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic. And so we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with them and with our attorneys, or her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us. And we left. This is the moment digital research dropped the ball. IBM, distinctly unimpressed with their reception, went back to Microsoft. Bill Gates isn't the man to give a rival a second chance. He saw the opportunity of a lifetime.
the digital research didn't seize that. And we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart. So <laughs> we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only BASIC, but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure, and basically every, every product the company had, we had committed to do for IBM in a very short time frame. But there was a problem. IBM needed an operating system fast, and Microsoft didn't have one. What they did have was a stroke of luck, the ingredient everyone needs to be a billionaire. Unbelievably, the solution was just across town. Paul Allen, Gates' programming partner since high school, had found another operating system. There's a local company here in, in, uh, in Seattle called Seattle Computer Products, a guy named Tim Patterson, and he had done an operating system, very rudimentary operating system, that was kind of like CPM. And we just told IBM, look, we'll go get this operating system from a small local company, we'll take care of it, we'll fix it up, and you can still do a PC. Tim Patterson's operating system, which saved the deal with IBM, was, well, adapted from Gary Kildall's CPM. So I took the CPM manual that I'd gotten from the retail computer store, $5 in 1976 or something, and uh, used that as the basis for uh, the, what the, what we, the application programming interface, the API for my operating system. And so uh, using these, these ideas that uh, came from different places, I started in April and it was about half time for four months I, uh, before I had my, my first working version. This is it. The operating system Tim Patterson wrote. He called it QDOS, the quick and dirty operating system. Microsoft and IBM called it PCDOS 1.0. And under any name, it looks an awful lot like CPM. On this computer here, I have running a PCDOS and CPM86, and frankly, it's very hard to tell the difference between the two. The command structures are the same, so are the directories. In fact, the only obvious external difference is the floppy drive is labeled A in PCDOS and C in CPM. Some difference, and yet one generated billions in revenue and the other disappeared. As usual in the PC business, the prize didn't go to the inventor, but to the exploiter of the invention. In this case, that wasn't Gary Kildall. It wasn't even Tim Patterson. There was still one problem. Tim Patterson worked for Seattle Computer Products, or SCP. They still own the rights to QDOS, rights that Microsoft had to have. But then we went back and said to them, look, you know, we want to buy this thing. And SCP was like most little companies, and they, you know, always needed cash. And so that was when they went into the negotiation. And uh, so ended up working out a deal to, uh, uh, to buy the operating system uh, from him for, for, for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. Hey, let's pause there to savor an historic moment. <laughs> for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. It had to be the deal of the century, if not the millennium. It was certainly the deal that made Bill Gates and Paul Allen multi-billionaires and allowed Paul Allen to buy toys like these, his own NBA basketball team and arena. Microsoft bought outright for $50,000 the operating system they needed, and they turned around and licensed it to the world for up to $50 per PC. Think of it, 100 million personal computers running MS-DOS software funneling billions into Microsoft, a company that back then was 50 kids managed by a 25-year-old who needed to wash his hair. Nice work if you can get it. And Microsoft. There are no two places further apart in the USA than southeastern Florida and Washington State, where Microsoft is based. This, this is Florida, Boca Raton, and this building right here is where the IBM PC was developed. Okay. Here, the nerds from Seattle joined forces with the suits of corporate Hopefully, uh, America. Hopefully, YouTube's not going to get me for keeping that, that in the video, but... Uh, I think it's uh, that's that stuff's running forever in my channel Z. That's what my channel Z does. So when you come into it, it just starts playing whatever it's playing, whatever it thinks you you should be seeing at that point in time, based upon what started playing at some point in the past. So you just got a taste there of how Microsoft came to be. 
but they didn't have a graphical user interface until Xerox Park uh, revealed to Steve Jobs what they were doing, and that was what led to the GUI-based operating system. And that was what that whole thing was about. But the um, thing is called, um, um, it was done in the 80s. It was a guy by the name of X Kringley. It was his pen name. Um, he's a, he's a, a journalist, uh, a computer journalist. And um, he, he was the guy that came up with the three-part series. And forever be one of my most favorite documentaries, most favorite uh, presentations of uh, the history of the computer, because he really got everybody to tell their story, and even Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and everybody to chip in. And those guys now, one's dead and one's still living, but uh, you know he's old. He's in his 60s, and you know, that's Bill Gates in uh, our 70s. I don't know how old Bill Gates is. He's not much older than me, I don't think. Let me see. I, he is much older than me. He's been at least 20 years older than me. So he's got to be in his 70s because I'm 48. But I was, I was one of the youngsters that uh, started using BASIC on the Commodore 64s and stuff. But after Microsoft came to be, they, one of the things they did is they just started taking over everything, you know. And uh, I think it's not Bill, probably not Bill Gates' fault that it, that's the way it became. It's just that. You had a lot of people that were really energized to conquer the world, and in conquering that, that also meant kind of ruining other industries. And so I've always been kind of um, tainted by that, uh, by had, what had happened as a result. But, oh, wow, that has nothing to do with what I was going to do this video about, which was about how to get toys into Alt Space VR. You got it. Then you got then some, and a little bit of my brain fell into the uh, a little bit of my um, okay. There we go.